A bodybuilder one day went to Africa. He was doing a tour of Africa. He was one of these hugely buffed guys. And he was doing a tour and they went to a little village. And they thought they would entertain the villagers by letting him do a lot of his profiles of physique. And so he did all of these different turns and twists and muscles were bulging. And it was quite an impressive performance that this tribe had never seen before, this kind of uh, bodybuilding exposition. After he was completed, the tribal chief said to him, he said, that really looked good. That was extremely impressive. He said, I, I don't know that I've seen that many muscles on a man before. He said, what else do you use all of that for? To which the bodybuilder, this was his profession, he said, well, nothing else. To which the tribal chief said, what a waste. To have all that muscle and not use it. What a waste to have all this armor and not use it. The Apostle Paul has said to the church at Ephesus and to us that your struggle is not against the physical world. Verse 12 of chapter 6, flesh and blood. That's where it is expressed. That's not where it's rooted. That's merely where the fruit manifests itself. It's not against the physical world, flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and world forces of this darkness, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Whatever is plaguing you today emanates from the spiritual realm. So if you and I do not address the cause, you can't get to the cure. The enemy doesn't want you to know or take seriously that it emanates from the spiritual realm because then you might address it spiritually. As long as he can keep you dealing with the fruit and bypass the root, he can keep you hostage. Paul says, your wrestle is in another realm. It's in heavenly places. And because your battle is in the spiritual realm, that's where your fight must be. But the good news is, is he tells you to stand firm because in that realm, Jesus has already gotten victory. In the spiritual realm, regardless of what you're going through in the physical realm, in the spiritual unseen realm, Jesus Christ has already gotten victory. You are victorious in the invisible, even though you may be thoroughly defeated in the visible. So if you want to be victorious in the physical like you are in the spiritual, you must address the physical spiritually. If you don't address the visible physical spiritually, then you have a victory that you're not experiencing because of how the physical is dominating. One of the toughest things for God to get his people to do is to look at life and live life from the spiritual frame of reference and not from the reference point of the five senses. He has given us equipment with which to do that. He comes to verse 18 in Ephesians 6 and he says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and pray on my behalf. I want you to notice how many times the word or a synonym for prayer is used in that short segment. All prayer and petition, pray. Comes to the end of it, petition for all the saints. Beginning of verse 19, and pray. He closes out this segment with a call to prayer or what I call putting on the armor. How do you put on the armor? How do you wear 
what God has given us for victory. How do we grab it, get it, hold on to it? And he tells you in verse 18 and following, he says, the answer is prayer. Now the question is, what is it? We talk about prayer, we speak about it, we do it. But I want to take us a little deeper to make sure we understand it. Because when you understand prayer, it changes that you pray, how you pray, whether you pray, and your expectations having prayed. For far too many people, even Christians, prayer is like the national anthem before a football game. Or baseball game. It gets the game started but has absolutely no relevance to what's happening on the field. It is an exercise in um, habit. Most of us, for example, when we pray before we eat, really don't need our minds to do that. Because it's going to be the same thing we say every day. Lord bless this food and nourish it to our bodies in Jesus' name. Amen. Most of us really don't need our minds when we go to bed. If we're tired, you know, bless me, bless my family, give me a good night's sleep, you know, protect me during the night, wake me up tomorrow, in Jesus' name, amen. It is carrying forth an expectation and a routine without meaning. For many of us, prayer is like um, a spare tire. We want it there in case we really need it. But if we don't need it, as long as it's back there somewhere and we can whip it out, particularly in an emergency, then we need it. But I want to explain what Paul wants to explain, which is why he uses it so many times in this verse, coming at the end of this section. Because if you understand prayer in the context of this section, it will change whether you pray and in fact how you pray and it will change what you get when you pray. Simply defined, I would like to define prayer as earthly permission for heavenly interference. Earthly permission for heavenly interference. It is earth giving heaven permission to interfere or to intervene in what is happening in my world of reality from the spiritual point of view. Prayer is giving heaven permission to intervene. Now, that raises a question. Why does heaven need permission? Why, why must I give heaven permission? There's a whole theology behind this, but to sum it up, you have to understand how God organized the world to work. He organized the world to work through people. Therefore, when he created Adam and Eve, he said, let them rule. So God has given us rulership over the earth. And he joins us when invited to do so. In other words, there are certain things God's going to do because, you know, he's God and he can do it. But there are many things and maybe even most things that God does not intervene on unless requested. Because he wants to know you want him. You need him, desire him, and have expectations of him. And so he does not intervene or participate unless requested to do so. Because God has given you and me the right to leave him out. You can leave him out. You can, you can put him on the shelf. You can act independently of him. Let me explain something. Prayer doesn't make God do anything. Okay? Prayer doesn't force him, cajole him, if God doesn't plan to do it, I don't care how much you pray about it. Prayer does not force God's hand. But what prayer does is it calls on God to intervene 
in ways he wants to intervene anyway, but won't do it until requested to do so. Let me show you what I mean, for example. If you look at, well, let me show you two passages right quick on this. First of all, James, the end of the book of James. He says in James chapter 5, verse 16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. He says pray for one another so that you may be healed. In other words, he makes a condition of the healing, the prayer. Then he makes a general statement. The effectual prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. The effectual prayer, we'll tell you how to make your prayers effectual in a moment, but the effectual prayer of a righteous man, a man who's living to please God, accomplishes much. Not a little, a whole lot. Elijah, verse 17, was a man with a nature like ours. In other words, don't say, I wish I was back in the Old Testament because God did all that stuff back there for them. He says, Elijah was just like you. He had a nature, he was a man, he was human. And he prayed earnestly, effectually, that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced fruit. It says, he's an ordinary man, just like you and me. Elijah has nothing on you. He had a like nature, just a regular man. But he was a righteous man and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it stopped raining for three years. He prayed again that it would rain and it rained and then produced fruit or produced results on earth because of course that's what rain does. It allows vegetation and fruit to grow. So he says that this ordinary man got heaven to move, because rain comes from up there. There was a problem on earth, he called on heaven, and heaven moved. But I want to take you back to when he prayed. So turn back to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 18 verse 1, now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Okay, now all we read in James in the New Testament was that he prayed it would not rain and stopped, then he prayed that he would rain and it started. That's all James tells us. But the Bible tells us that we ought to compare scripture with scripture. So now I'm taking you back to when he prayed that it would rain. God said in chapter 18 verse 1, Go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the face of the earth. What did God say he was going to do? He said he was going to send rain. The sovereign God said this is what I'm going to do. Now in chapter 18, if you go over to verse 41, now Elijah said to Ahab, he was told to go show himself to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. And Ahab went up to eat and drink. But Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked, he said, there is nothing. And he said, go back seven times. He came about at the seventh time that he said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. And he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot, go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you. In a little while, the sky grew black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy shower and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up his loins and outran Ahab to Jezreel. Now there's a whole bunch here. Let me just give you the cliff notes. 
God said it's going to rain. So watch this. When Elijah prayed, he only prayed about what God said. In other words, he wasn't just making up stuff on the spot. God said it was going to rain. But wait a minute. What God said didn't come true until he prayed. Even though God declared it in the heavenly realm, in the spiritual realm, no rain hit earth until it got called down for from Elijah. In other words, prayer called down what God already had intended to do. Prayer didn't make God do something he hadn't planned to do. God had already told him, I planned for it to rain. All prayer did was call it down. And it was an interesting way he prayed. It says he crouched down on his knees and put his head down. Now that may not be much to you, but it means a whole lot back in the Old Testament. Because when a pregnant woman was getting ready to give birth, they didn't have stirrups like we had it today. It would be travail. It would be pushing out what had grown in. When Elijah got down on his knees, he was getting in a travail position because he was pulling out of heaven that which heaven intended to do until he got pushed down to earth. And he pushed seven times. Mm. Seven times. Until that baby got birth called rain. In other words, all Elijah's prayer did was grab what God had already intended to do and bring it down to earth. Prayer is not making God do something he never planned to do. Prayer is grabbing what God intended to do and driving it down to earth. But it doesn't happen on earth just because it's already intended in heaven. It happens on earth because it was grabbed by earth when heaven has already declared it to be and brought it down to earth by our participation with it. What I'm trying to say is when Paul says to pray, he is not just saying have, have these general, meaningless, repetitious, empty conversations and think that because you threw God's name out, it was something significant. He says what makes it significant is you understand what prayer is. It is earthly permission for heavenly interference predicated on the fact that this is what heaven intended to do. Prayer, let me put it another way. Your problem is in heavenly places. Prayer takes you there. Prayer is the human means of entering in to the supernatural realm in order to utilize the armor. When you look back at Ephesians chapter 6, and you look at the last piece of armor before he even talks about prayer, notice what it is. He says that we are to use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In other words, the best way to pray is when you throw God's word back at him. You see, he knew he could pray for rain because he had heard the word of God about rain. So he knew what to expect because he knew what God had said. Having known what God has said and praying in light of what he says gives you authority in the spiritual realm. Let me put it another way. If you don't know what God has said or you don't know what to expect from God, then you will pray vague prayers, you will pray empty prayers, and the armor won't seem to work because you're not connecting it with the spiritual realm in which it operates. He says, I want you to make contact with God. Flesh and blood. See, we, we spend all of our time talking to men about God and very little time talking to God about men. We spend a lot of time talking to a 
and about our circumstances. We'll talk on the phone. We'll talk to people who usually can't solve our problem. We're looking for sympathy. And so we talk to folks who can sympathize with us. But what you need are answers, not sympathy. What you need is heaven to invade earth. When you throw God's stuff back at him in a thing called prayer, you're not making God do something. You are simply receiving by faith what he's already planned to do. That changes the power of prayer. You know, we've got, we've got radio and TV signals all around us. All around us, there are signals, there are signals in the, in the air. Right here in this building, there are radio waves and there are TV signals and they're all around us. But we're not hearing any music and we're not seeing anything on the TV screen. Why? Because we don't have anything right now to pull it down. In other words, if you turn on the radio right now, what's invisible will become visible. You'll be able to hear it. If you, if you had a TV set plugged in, you would be able to see it because you have something to receive it. In other words, you need something in the physical to receive the waves in the invisible. Even if you don't have a radio and don't have a television, the waves are still operating. They're still all over the place. They're still surrounding us. But the lack of something to grab it and receive it and bring it to the physical keeps you from knowing it's there. God is moving. God is all over the place. The spiritual realm is totally surrounding you right now. There are angels in this room. There are demons in this room. The invisible realm is all over you right now. You just can't see it. And you can't feel it until you draw it down. Okay? Until you draw it down. And so, so what he is saying is prayer is the means of contacting the invisible spiritual realm and bring it down to the visible physical realm and that is the way you engage the armor and put the armor to work. Now let's look at what he says here in chapter 6. He says, with all prayer and partition, pray at all times in the spirit. Now watch this. He says, pray at all times. There are two Greek words for time, chronos and kairos. Chronos is simply time in general. It's seconds to minutes, minutes to hours, hours to days, days to weeks, weeks to months, months to years. That's chronos. That's just time, general time. We exist in time and we exist linearly in time. Time moves forward. That's chronos. It's just the general concept of time. But chronos is not the word for time here. The Greek word for time here is kairos. That has to do with a specific, specified time. If I say kairos, if I say I'm going to meet you at 12 o'clock, that's not time in general. That's time specific. That's a certain time, a specific time. And if I tell you I'm going to meet you at 12 o'clock, you know what that means? There's a reason why we're meeting. Because if I, if I make an appointment, that means I'm meeting you for a purpose. So it is a specific time, an opportune time, or an appointed time. Kairos is the word used here, not chronos. When he says, I want you to pray at all times, He's not talking about 24 hours a day, you having this uh, verbal conversation with God. He's talking about all opportune times, all specific times, all appointed times. That's what the word means. Why would he be using kairos instead of chronos? There's a chronos concept, pray without ceasing. That is always stay in communication with God. But that's not what he says here. He says, I want you to pray at all kairos times, appointed times, scheduled times, opportune times, specific times. Why is he being so specific when he talks about your communication with God here? Because of the context in which this discussion about prayer occurs. 
It occurs in the context of spiritual warfare. It occurs in the context of putting on spiritual armor. And notice the real context that it occurs in, in verse 13, take on the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. He's talking about the evil day. That's the day when all hell breaks loose. That's the day when you feel like you're going to lose your mind. That's the day when nothing's going right. That's the day when you, you're just not going to make it. That's the day when you wonder, how am I going to get through another day? Because you're under attack. Some days you don't go through that. Some days the day is fine and you may have a little thing go wrong here and a little thing go wrong there. But overall, life is good and life is, life is going okay. But you and I know some days are not like that. Some days it looks like the devil's riding your back. Looks like everywhere you turn, something is going wrong. It looks like every direction you look in, God is invisible and is nowhere to be found. That's the evil day. That's the day when evil has descended upon you, trying to own you, dominate you, and dictate to you. He says on that day, at that time, when you're under that kind of attack, you need this kind of prayer. Because that day demands the armor of God be worn by you in all of God's power brought to bear on your circumstances. What he is calling for is specific prayer, concentrated prayer, Elijah kind of prayer where you have to throw God's stuff back up at him so that he can re-intervene into your circumstances. One of the reasons we don't see God show up is that we don't earnestly talk to God when we need him. We got these vague prayers that we've been saying for 25 years, okay? But let me tell you something about when all hell breaks loose. When all hell breaks loose, you have a unique ability to get specific. See, when everything's going, right, going well, it's easy to be general. You know, I thank you Lord for blessing me, you know. But when all hell breaks loose, you got specific stuff jacking you up. You've got specific things that are causing you headaches and heartaches and life aches. And he's calling you in those specific times. That is the time to call on God and he says how you are to do it. He says you are to call on him in the spirit. In the spirit. Let me say it another way. You are to call on him spiritually. You are to call on him spiritually. Now, there's the opposite of spirit is flesh. So maybe if I say pray in the flesh and do the negative, you'll understand what he means by pray in the spirit. To pray in the flesh is simply to mouth words coming out of your humanity with no spiritual attachment to them. It is simply my humanity it's generally how we say grace. Most prayers or many prayers when we say grace are prayers in the flesh. They're just routine things that we say because we know we're supposed to say grace before we eat with no spiritual attachment. That is no spiritual connection to it. To pray in the spirit means that you're making a spiritual connection to the communication that you want to take place with God. Now, you can do that in a number of ways. You can quote scriptures in your prayer. Or you can take a principle of scripture and place it in front of God. See, when you tell God, God, remember you said, you would supply all my needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And I got this emergency situation going on right now. But the reason I'm talking to you is because you said that when I was in this, you said, I've never seen the righteous nor the seed begging bread. You said, you see, see, when you pray spiritually, because the Bible says God's words are spirit, and you bring spiritual truth into your conversation with God, you are now praying in the spirit. You are praying spiritually. You're not just playing fleshly or randomly or, or routinely or rotely. You are now calling on God, bringing the spirit to bear in the conversation. Now let me tell you what happens when you pray spiritually. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. When you pray spiritually, when you pray bringing the spiritual to bear. 
in the situation. He says, this whole chapter is about the Spirit of God, Romans chapter 8. And he wants us to know that the Spirit is at work. He says, let me look at a couple of verses. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth until now. So again, this childbirth thing, this groaning, this aching, this labor pain. He says, and not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Anybody here ever groan? In other words, because circumstances in life got you going, mm, oh, ah. Life is hurting you and you're groaning, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and, and redemption of the body. Verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now this is when you're groaning and don't know what to say. It's not got that bad. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints, watch this, according to the will of God. So what he says is when you bring what you know to be the will of God into the presence of God and you are groaning, the Holy Ghost groans with you. And because he knows how deep the problem is, how deep the need is, how bad the attack is, he comes alongside and helps a brother out, helps a sister out in your weak moment when you can't make it another day. But you bring spiritually into the presence of God, the spirit takes over and he lifts you up in a way you cannot lift yourself up and neither can anybody you know lift you up. So why do you want to pray in the spirit? You want to pray in the spirit because he knows the territory. You want to pray in the spirit because he knows what's happening up there in the invisible realm. He knows what the evil one is doing to you. He's calling you to pray in the spirit. Let, let me show you how this thing works because I, I think this will help us in our prayer and make my prayer more dynamic and more real instead of more rote and more boring. For many of us, uh, a prayer is a boring thing because we don't understand what's happening in the invisible. And if you understood what's happening in the visible, it wouldn't be boring anymore. So let me show you Daniel chapter 9. I know we're turning to a number of verses today, but I want you to understand this principle so that you and I can experience the power of prayer. Daniel chapter 9. In the book of Daniel, Daniel is a man after God's heart. And in Daniel chapter 9, look at verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the book of number of years, which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Okay, so he's reading the Bible. It says he read the book of Jeremiah. He was reading the Bible and he observed something. He observed what the scripture says, verse 3. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God. Okay. He read what God said, then he talked to God about it. Okay. So he found out the mind of God, the thoughts of God from the word of God, and then he talked to God about what God said. Okay, now you're praying in the spirit. Whenever you bring God's stuff back at him, you're praying in the spirit. So why do you want to study the Bible? Well, one is to know more about God, but the other is to throw God's stuff back up at him. He prays in the spirit, okay? Now, go down to verse 20. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain to my God while I was still speaking in prayer then the man Gabriel that's the angel whom I had seen in the vision previously came to me in my extreme weariness because he was tired and the time of the evening offering he gave me instruction and talked with me and said oh Daniel I have now come forth to give you insight and understanding wait a minute now he read the word then he talked to God about the word he read 
Then God sent an angel to say, let me help you understand some stuff. Because a lot of us could get through what we're going through if we just understood what was going on. But because, like Marvin Gaye, we just want to know what's going on, and we don't know what's really going on, we don't make the connection to what God says and our communication with God. Notice, he didn't send the angel to give him understanding about his situation until he prayed. But he didn't pray until he found out what God had to say. He found out what God had to say, he prayed, God sent a messenger to give him understanding. Look at verse 23, this is going to get good here in a minute. He says in verse 23, at the beginning of your supplication, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed, a righteous man, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. All right, now watch this. He says, uh, you, 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 don't miss this. He says, when you prayed, the command was given for me to come. All right, watch this now. When you prayed, the command was given for me to come. Now turn to chapter 10, verse 10. Then behold, a hand touched me, set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words which I am about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to your words. Notice, I came because of your words. But your words were tied to God's words. So when you brought your words, hooked them up to God's words, God sent me to talk to you about what you talked to God about. But watch this. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Uh-oh. -uh. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princesses, Michael the archangel, came to help me. For I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to give you understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision pertains to days yet future. All right, let me break this down. He's reading the word. And God says something that grabs him. He's reading the prophet Jeremiah and the words jump off the page. And he says, well, wait a minute. This applies to me. He then gets on his knees and talks to God about what he just read. So he's now in the spirit because he's bringing God to bear on the situation. Twice it says, on the day you prayed, God sent the answer. All right, watch this now. See, because there are a lot of people here wondering why God's taking so long. Uh, he told Daniel, your prayer was answered the very day you prayed it. Now, why was your prayer answered the day you prayed it? Because you're highly esteemed, you're a righteous man, and you're praying according to the word. When you're a righteous person praying according to the word, it doesn't take long for God to answer your prayer. In fact, he says, God answered it on the same day that you ask it. But there was a three-week delay. You and God answered it the same day, but it says it took me 21 days to deliver it to you. Now, let me tell you about God's post office. God's got a post office. He got some mailmen. These mailmen called angels, their job is to deliver the answer to you. Everybody's been assigned an angel who's a Christian. If you're a Christian, you've got an angel assigned to you, and that's your personal mailman. And that job, the job of that angel is to deliver God's answers to you. When you, based on the word, communicate with God in prayer, as a righteous person, you're just like Elijah, you're calling down from heaven on earth a need that heaven needs to address. But there was a three-week delay of the angel. Okay, Gabriel, why was there a three-week delay? 
There was a three week delay because a demon showed up. He says the prince of Persia, that's a demon because he calls himself as an angel, a prince. He says the demon over Persia, which is where you're living, the demon that's hovering around where you're living was there and he blocked me as I was trying to deliver to you on the same day that you ask it, the demon, you see, unless you know what's happening in the invisible world, all you see is God's not answering my prayer in the visible world. He say, but Daniel, I want you to understand what's going on. This was a demon and the demon lived where you're living. The demon lived in your neighborhood. The demon lived in Persia, which is where you're living. Just like God has a post office, to deliver your answer, hell has a post office to block the delivery. Hell wants to keep the delivery away. So now you got a battle between angels that's stopping you from getting the answer to your prayer. It's not that God hasn't answered your prayer. He answered it the day you prayed your prayer. But because there is a battle in the heavenlies, there is warfare in the spiritual realm, that's why that is the delay. So the question is not, God, why haven't you answered my prayer? It's how do we work out this spiritual warfare so the answer that you've given gets to me? He says, I was coming down and the demon or the prince of Persia that is set up to block the answer that I was to deliver to you, he blocked me. And we were rumbling for three weeks. But then God sent Michael, he big angel in charge, he sent Michael down to give a brother some help. And when he sent Michael down, now if God had to call Michael, that means the demons were rough. So he has to call Michael. Michael and Gabriel double team the dude, get him out of the way so that he could deliver the blessing. Now, here's why you got to keep praying. Don't keep praying to get God to answer. If it's based on his word and grace has already provided everything you're supposed to get, you don't keep praying to get God the answer. You are now praying for God to intervene to keep Satan from blocking the answer he's already given. So now you're praying in faith. When you pray according to God's word and you're calling on God according to his word, you don't have to ask him over and over and over and over again for the same thing. If it's according to his word, once you ask him sincerely, the rest of your prayers are thank you for answering, thank you for answering, thank you for answering because you already answered the day I delivered it. And the reason I got a delay is there's stuff going on in the spiritual world that's giving me my delay. It's not that God has an answer. God is good on his word. He's good on his promises. He can be depended upon. So you keep praying because you're trying to break through the delivery that was already granted. And that's why you can spend time giving thanks because God answers when you ask based on his word. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. This is... This will make you want to pray. He says back in Ephesians, let me wind this up. He says back in Ephesians, all prayer, all time, all perseverance. And look at what he says. He says in verse 18, he says, here's what I want you to do. With this in view, be on alert. Be on alert. Translation, pray with your eyes open. Okay? Be, keep your eyes open. That's, that's what it means. Do, do you know most prayers in the Bible are not with eyes closed? I mean, we know that. We know we do that to kind of concentrate or to, to show reverence. But most of the time when people are praying, the Bible says, and they lifted their eyes. Okay? Eyes were open. Okay? He says, keep your eyes open. What are you keeping your eyes open for? Look, look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. 
He wants us to pray with our eyes open. And he says in 1 Peter, these words. Be of sober spirit and be on the alert. Keep your eyes open. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He says, the devil is trying to eat you up like a roaring lion. But a lot of people don't know when lions roar. Lions don't roar when they're coming up on their prey. Uh Uh-uh, they don't roar then. Lions roar after they get their prey. It's when they get you, they are, they, they roar. In other words, it's their declaration of victory. They roar after the fact, not before the fact. You have to be on alert because they creeping up on you until they pounce on you. After they pounce on you and devour you, they roar because of the victory. He says, keep your eyes open when you pray. Because when you're calling down heaven, hell wants to block that. So keep your eyes open, that is spiritually open, to see what's going on around you. Because when you are talking to heaven, hell wants to block that. That is why so many times when you're trying to pray, distractions show up. So many times when you're trying to pray, you're sleepy. So many times when you're trying to pray, something pops up because the lion does not want you to interfere with his trying to block the answer from getting to you. And that's why you got to pray with your eyes open. That's why you got to you, you gotta do it. You know, if you go to Jerusalem, you'll see the Jews up at the wailing wall and they got the Bible in front of their hand and you see them doing this. You see them doing that at the wailing wall. Okay? The reason that they're doing that is so they don't go to sleep. If they keep moving so that they stay alert and stay awake as they communicate with God at the wailing wall. That's the reason they do that. He say, pray with your eyes open because when you talk to heaven, your prayer giving heaven permission is so powerful that the enemy does not want that prayer to go through. And so he's going to try to distract you from praying. He's going to try to dilute you from praying. He's going to cause something to come up to interfere with your prayer. You thought that was just chance or luck or distraction. No, it wasn't. It was a lion trying to keep you from being able to get a breakthrough that you've been looking for for so long that was already approved in heaven a long time ago. Two men heard that they were giving um, $5,000 bounties for capturing or killing wolves. $5,000 per wolf. Boy, let's become bounty hunters for these wolves. So he and his friend decided to become bounty hunters and to capture woods, $5,000 of wood. One day they woke up in the middle of the night and they were surrounded by 50 pairs of wolves, all with teeth, glittering, ravenous wolves, hungry. He woke up his other guy. He said, John, we're rich. See, you got to have the right perspective. You got to have the right perspective. If the enemy is trying to distract your prayer, that's good news. That's good news. That's good news. He's trying to distract your prayer because that means that it's already been approved. It's already on the way and hell doesn't want you to get it because he wants to keep you from making contact with God. Somebody ought to be ready to talk to God. Somebody ought to be ready to find out what God has to say and throw it back up in his face because a lot of the stuff you're asking for has already been pre-approved. It's just that in the spiritual realm, there is the attempt to block it. But if you will persevere at the Kairos time and specifically throw it back in God's face, he'll send the help needed to break it through so that you see it revealed in the physical realm. In heaven, there's only going to be one scarred person. You won't have any scars on you. I won't have any scars on me. But he'll still have nail prints in his hand, scars in his feet, and a scar in his side. Because he will remind you 
that your eternal destiny was tied to the scars I took for you on Calvary. Many of you remember many years ago there was a TV show called Early Edition. And that's where a man would get tomorrow's newspaper today so he knew what was coming because he got the future given to him in advance. And so he knew what he needed to do in light of what the newspaper said tomorrow because he got it ahead of time. Prophecy is God's newspaper telling you what's coming tomorrow so you have the information today. The Bible is the website, Jesus is the passcode, and if you really want to understand what's happening in our world and where we are going, prophecy, the predicting of the future. God can make no prophetic mistakes because of his perfection. The Bible is full of prophecies, things that were predicted in advance, including the birth of Jesus, the fact that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, the fact that he would ride on a donkey on Palm Sunday. All of that is predicted 700 and more years in the Old Testament before it ever happened in the New Testament because God is impeccably perfect in his prophetic pronouncements. So anything God says is going to happen, you can bank your bottom dollar, it is going to happen precisely as he said it would happen. So to ignore prophecy as given by God is to ignore the future. So the Bible is God's prophetic syllabus giving us an outline of things to come. And so today I would just like to survey the prophetic calendar. In Matthew 24, verse 3, the disciples ask a question. They said, what are the signs of your coming? What, what, what do we look to as a sign of your coming? Jesus then responded to them and he said to them, He says in verse 6, You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. For those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom in various places. There will be famines, which can be pestilences, and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. God will not give us a date and time of his arrival. But if you come back home to a city, to your city, whether it's Dallas or wherever you live, you will notice something. The closer you get to the city, the bigger the signs become the bigger the signs become, let you know that you're getting closer to your destination. Jesus says that the signs that you are to look for are not only the conflicts, but the rumors that surround it and the scope of them. There will be nation against nation and there will be rumor against rumor and this will bubble up. He says, but it is not yet time. So let me start off by letting you know that I am not saying that what we are seeing today is proof positive Jesus is coming tomorrow. What I am saying is it could be. I have said that there are one of two things happening today. Either Jesus is setting something up because the signs are so big, because it involves the whole world, because of the nuclear holocaust, because COVID has affected the whole world. So the whole world has been infected and affected by the things that are taking place, that the signs clearly appear to be larger. So he could be on the verge of his return, or he could be doing an international reset of how history works. Either way, it's still his story. 
He said, but when you see the signs, it is not time yet. Look at the signs, but it's not time yet. Something must be happening with the signs that tells us the signs, but that something else is going to happen first. So let's put up a prophetic calendar to use as our guide this morning as we look at the highlights of what we are to anticipate. Right now, you are in what the Bible calls the church age. It's called in uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 24, the times of the Gentiles. If you are a chess player, you know there's a clock. When you put the clock, that means you've made your move. You've now opened it up for your opposer to make their move. God had determined that Israel would be in his program. They rejected Jesus. The Israel clock stopped. The church clock began. So we're in now the church age, the age between Pentecost and the rapture, where God has established his church, Jesus has established his church, people are being one to Christ, and those who accept Christ become part of this church age. The church age comes to a conclusion at the rapture. The reason why it is not the end yet is there is an event that will take place before the end time clock gets punched, and that event is called the rapture. Look with me at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. At 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, but I would not have you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep so that you are not to grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Please notice verse 14. God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep, which means when you fall asleep, you're not in the grave. Because if he's going to bring you with him, that means you are with him. So the moment you die is the moment that you're translated up to be with the Lord and you come back with him. For this uh, we say to you by the word of the Lord, that's our authority, that we who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, that means rapture, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we shall for always be with the Lord, therefore comfort one another with these words. The rapture is when Jesus Christ does not come back to earth, he comes back to the clouds and we are raptured up to meet him. If Jesus Christ were to come today, everyone in this house who has trusted Jesus Christ as their personal savior would leave this place. If... If I'm gone and you're still here, that's because you're not saved. So before this service is over, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. But we want to make sure that you are part of the rapture. We come, the, the dead in Christ, those who've already gone ahead of us, will come with him. Those who are dead will get new bodies, new glorified bodies, so the glorified bodies will meet the returning soul and spirit, and we will have our glorified existence. We who are alive will be changed. Everything wrong with you in the rapture will be made right immediately. Everybody will go back to the age of Adam and Eve when they were created in the garden. You'll get your hair back. Your scars will disappear. In 1 Corinthians 15, we read these words. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Verse 51 says, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, let me tell you what the twinkle of an eye is. A twinkle of an eye is faster than a blink. It's the twitch of the eye. It's faster than a blink. You will be changed. And it says, 
For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Yes. So the rapture takes place, boom, in a twinkling of an eye. All of those who are believers in Christ will be raptured up to meet the Lord. We will have reunion with those who have already gone before us. And we will be taken to heaven for the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ will take place while an event I'll talk about in a moment is taking place on earth where believers are given their rewards for their faithfulness to the Lord between the time of their conversion and the time of their death or the rapture. So what God will be looking at when he raptures us is how faithful were you as a follower of Christ. Faithfulness means consistency over time. It doesn't mean celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. It means day by day wanting to follow the Lord as a lifestyle and not as an occasional event. So we will all be changed. It's just like when a seed is planted in the ground, what comes out of the ground is a lot bigger and a lot better than the seed that was planted. When death takes place, the seed is planted. When the new body is raised, something greater than was put in the ground is coming out of the ground to meet the spirit and soul that comes back with him when he returns. So the rapture is what Jesus offers the church. The reason we believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, I'll talk about tribulation in a moment, is because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, you and I have not been appointed unto wrath. And since the tribulation is the wrath of God and we've not been appointed unto wrath and since these are signs but something must happen first, the thing that happens first is the rapture so that the time of wrath can be installed and instigated. So we start off with the rapture. Those who have not been faithful at the judgment seat of Christ will be put in the penalty box. If you've ever watched hockey, you know that uh, there's a penalty box for those who have done infractions on the ice to no longer be full participants in uh, the game. In other words, heaven has differentiating differences based on faithfulness. Luke chapter 19 tells us that. So, we are here, the church age, the rapture. But when you are at a play, if you go on to Broadway or you play, you, you hear rumblings behind the curtain. The curtain hadn't opened yet, but when you hear the noise, you know it should be soon. You watch an advertisement on TV and it simply says this movie is coming soon. They didn't give you a date, but that meant look and expect it. So we are to look and expect and live in expectation of the coming of the Lord. And the signs should up the amp of us looking for it. Because the signs just keep getting bigger. Which means we're closing in on the destination. When the rapture takes place, it inaugurates a seven-year event. That seven-year event is called the tribulation. This time of tribulation, it's called Jacob's trouble. It's called in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in the darkness that it should overtake you. Christians, those who have accepted Christ are in the rapture. When the rapture happens, that opens up the day of the Lord. It's called the day of the Lord because now it's the day of man. You say, how can there be a God who allows all these tragedies, all these difficulties, all this pain, all this? Because today is the day of man. And he has allowed man to do things based on their decision making. Once the rapture happens, it is no longer the day of man. It is now the day of the Lord and he is going to take over completely. 
It is during this time of tribulation, this seven year period prophesied in the book of Daniel. It's called, it's, it's the 69th week leading to this, this time of, uh, of uh, international upheaval where God will intervene directly. Satan will be released to a full orb. Now you think Satan is rough now. You haven't seen anything yet. Most of the book of Revelation is about this time of tribulation. This time of tribulation when there will be complete upheaval in the world. The tribulation revolves around a figure. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be all this conflict and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde will show up. This will be an international figure who will purport to bring order to a world in chaos. And his name is called the Antichrist. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he wants us to know about this unique figure. Now we request you, brethren, verse 1, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. That you not be quickly shaken by your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. The apostasy means a massive turning away from God. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. The son of destruction. So there is a man who does not keep rules, lawlessness, who will become manifested. Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God and object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God displaying himself as being God. So the Antichrist will display himself as deity. Do you not remember when I was still with you? I was telling you these things and you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed. In other words, we don't know who he is yet because he's being held back. He could be very much alive right now, but not yet revealed. He says, for the mystery of lawlessness, it's a secret, is already at work. Only he who know, now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the world. Okay. When the Holy Spirit is removed, the restrainer, you and I are removed. That's the rapture. Because you and I are indwelt with the Holy Spirit if you've accepted Christ. So Holy Spirit is the restrainer. So when the Holy Spirit, the restrainer, is removed and he indwells every believer, he takes the believers with him in the rapture. When he takes the believers with him in the rapture, now the restrainer is gone. When the restrainer is gone, which means the saints who he indwells is gone with him, now the man of lawlessness will be revealed. So he could be very well here now if the rapture is going to happen soon, only waiting for the rapture to be made manifest because you can imagine when the rapture occurs, there's going to be chaos everywhere when Christians disappear. One easy way to see that is if you have a worldwide nuclear holocaust which creates havoc all over the world, the rapture happens at the same time, people are disappearing because the holocaust would do that, and now order needs to be brought to the whole world. So God has already set up ways where this could happen. Okay? So, he will then be revealed, this man of lawlessness. Then the lawless one, verse 8, will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one who is coming is in accord with the activity of Satan and with power and signs and wonders. Why will he be believed? Because he's going to bring miracles with him. He's going to bring miracles with him. What Jesus is to, to God, the Antichrist is to Satan. Jesus is the incarnation of deity 
The Antichrist is the incarnation of the devil. So that, that helps you to understand, by the way, um, if, if you'll look at Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13, um, you, you, you discover the unholy trinity. So we know about the holy trinity, but there's an unholy trinity. You've got, in verse 1, the dragon, which we're told in chapter 12 is the devil. Then you've got the beast in verse 1, and I saw a beast, and they worshipped, verse 4, uh, the dragon, because he gave authority to the beast. So you've got three figures in chapter 13. You've got the dragon, the first beast, and the second beast. That is, you've got Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. That explains verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who is understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man. And his number is 666. 666. Why is 666 important? That's a Trinitarian number. Six and six and six. It is six is the number of man. Man was created six. Man was created six. There will be a trinity that will deal with man. God, the trinity, wants to deal with man now. The devil, the trinity, the devil, the antichrist, the false prophet, that trinity will deal with men during the tribulation period. So it is the number of man or the number of the unholy trinity dealing with the human race during this period of time we call the tribulation period. But this is the antichrist. And the antichrist will bring havoc, verse 10, and with all deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. When you reject God, you open up to the devil. When you reject God's word, you open up to the devil. There are only two words, man's word and God's word. The question is, whose word are you going to believe? And the problem is, he will be so tricky with his miracles, tricky with his deception that you're going to believe his word just because he looks like he's got some don't believe every spirit the Bible says just because it's a miracle doesn't mean it came from God this tribulation this seven year period divided in the two halves, the first half and the second half, the second half is called the great tribulation because that's when stuff gets worse that's when you see the book of Revelation and feel free to read it. Uh, that the, the will open up and you will see all hell break loose on earth, which is one of the reasons you want to try to win your family to Christ now so they don't have to go through this. Because if they're here, they're going to face this. And this will be death and destruction and because it's God now making his final stand. As we come to the end of the tribulation, this seven-year period, we come to an event that we all know, Armageddon. As we come to the end of the tribulation, we come to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now this is very interesting because the second coming of Christ coincides with the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon comes at the end of the tribulation. But we're given some information where things right now could be being set up for them because remember, there's only a seven-year gap. Let me take you back now to Ezekiel 38 because these end-time things were prophesied thousands of years in advance. And in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 38, we have Gog and Magog. Gog is a man, Magog is a land. So Gog is the head of Magog. And the word of the Lord, verse 1, came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog and the land of Magog. He lists a number of other nations in verse 1 that will be associated with Gog, this man, and this land called Magog. Verse 15, you will come from your place out of the remote parts of the earth. 
you and many people with you, all of them riding on horses and a great assembly and a mighty army. So there is this army led by God. Chapter 39, verse 2, and I will turn you around, drive you on to take you up from the remotest parts of the north and bring you against the mountain of Israel. We're told that Gog, who leads a land called Magog, is to the remotest part of the north of Israel. Well, there's only one nation to the remotest part of the north of Israel that goes to the Arctic Sea, and that's Russia. Russia is the remotest part from Israel on, on our map. So don't be surprised that you see this movement of Russia that makes its way through conflict. And here's what you want to look for even now, although it won't be fulfilled for at least seven years in its fullest expression. There will be a move that will bring the Middle East into the conflict. And the thing that will move Russia to bring the Middle East into the conflict is oil. You think you got high gas prices now? You ain't seen nothing yet. Oil will become the dominant issue. And with oil being the issue and Middle East being in conflict with the oil-bearing nations and Russia being uh, coming down from the north, there will be a coming together of the Middle East, of Europe, of Russia, and it says God is going to arrange for them to collect themselves against Israel. He says against the mountain of Israel. Now, this is a whole theology here. You can get the book, The Message Yet to Come to go into it. But Israel was chosen by God to bring in the living word and the written word. It would be the nation that would give birth to the Messiah and the Ten Commandments would come out of that. The scriptures would be birthed through the Jews. So that became God. He calls it the apple of his eye. So everything revolves around the place of Israel. When Jesus Christ comes back, he is coming back to Jerusalem. And he's coming back with us. Now let's talk about the second coming. Revelation 19, verse 11. I know I'm giving you a headache, but stick with me. Revelation 19, verse, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns, many diadems, and he has a name written on him which uh, no one except, uh, knows no one except himself. He's clothed with a robe dripped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, that's you and me, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword, so that it, were, it may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is the return of Jesus Christ. I like the way Matthew 24 puts it, that also describes his return, because it says, verse 29, But immediately, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds on the sky with power and great glory and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together the elect from the four winds and, uh, and one end of the sky to the other. So Jesus Christ is going to come back at the end of the tribulation with the saints who've already been raptured. When he comes back, 
According to Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, every eye will see him. In order for every eye to see him, this either has to be through technology, but if he came today, there are places that don't have technology that still exist. So how else, if he came right now and you don't have technology, can every eye see him? Simply by him looping around the sun. If he simply loops around the sun in his return, everybody will get to see this coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know this sounds like a movie. I know this sounds like Star Wars. I know this sounds like, I don't know if I can buy all that. Okay, well, you just stay here and wait to see whether it's true. So Armageddon is when God will bring, I love, back to Ezekiel 38, which describes this concept of, uh, of the coming of Armageddon, when he says that God is going to be the orchestrator of bringing the nations together to rebel against him. That none of this will happen without God's orchestration. Uh, uh, he says in Ezekiel chapter 38, uh, these words, he says, I will come on that day, verse 18, when God comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord that my fury will mount up in my anger and in my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I declare on that day, there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, the beasts of the field, the creeping things that creep, and all the men who on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. Verse 21, I will call for the sword against him on all my mountains, declares the Lord. Verse 22, with pestilence, with blood, I will enter into judgment with him, and I will rain on him and on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, and on a torrential rain, and have and hailstones and fire and brimstone and I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and make myself known in the sight of many nations and then they will know I am the Lord. They may not know it now. They may not believe it now. They may not acknowledge it now. But on that day, there will be no question because that's the day of the Lord. That's when I'm calling the shot. When Jesus Christ comes back, it sets up the millennium. Chapter 20, verse 1 of Revelation. Then I saw the angel come down from heaven holding the keys of the abyss and the great chain. He laid hold of the dragon, that is the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. A millennium is a thousand. Bound him a thousand years. Verse 3. Until the thousand years were completed. Verse 4. And reign with Christ. For a thousand years, verse 6, he says, uh, and will reign with him for a thousand years. A thousand, a thousand, a thousand. That means the millennium. When God created Adam, he created him to rule the earth as a man. God has never stopped that plan, that the earth would be ruled by a man. But every time he chose a man, the man failed. So there was no man uh, to rule the earth who he could trust. So God became a man so he could trust a man to rule the earth. When Jesus Christ comes back, Jesus Christ will set up the millennial kingdom. And oh, what a kingdom it's going to be. I will let you in on some. I'll just give you a couple of passages. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11 tells you a little bit about this millennial 1,000 year reign of Christ. In Isaiah chapter 11, here's what he says, beginning with verse uh, 6. He says, uh, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little boy will lead them and a cow and the bear will graze and the young will lie down together. The young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw with the ox and the nursing child will play it by the hole of the cobra and the weaned child will put, uh, put his hand in the viper's den and they will not be hurt. In other words, in, the, in, the, in this utopia, in this, in this perfect environment, there will be nothing allowed to bring pain or hurt. The Bible says a child will be a child at 100 years of age. Now we know this is not heaven yet because it still talks about people dying. 
So we're not in heaven yet because in heaven nobody dies. We're in the golden year of mankind when Jesus Christ will rule from Jerusalem and the Bible says he will rule with a rod of iron, which means there will be no rebellion allowed. Anything you're mad about, you better keep to yourself because there will be no rebellion allowed in his holy mountain as he rules. When the millennium comes to a completion, it leads to the final courtroom of history, which is the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, we read these words beginning in verse 11. Revelation 20 beginning in verse 11. I'm going through a lot of pages here. So, uh, so the thousand years are completed in verse 7. Satan will be released from his prison. During the millennium, Satan is not allowed to allow to promote rebellion. And Jesus is ruling with Orion, uh, Art Orion, so there'll be no rebellion. But at the end of the millennium, it says, verse 7, the thousand years were completed, Satan was released, and he came to deceive the nations. Because people who harbored rejection about God in their hearts, when Satan shows up, will be allowed to release it to show what they've been harboring against God. When that happens, then, verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose presence the earth and heaven fled away and no place found for them. And I saw the dead and the great and the small standing before the throne and the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And the dead in Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Here is the final courtroom in history where the final judge takes the white throne judgment. Please notice something. In the white throne judgment, people were judged on their deeds. People were judged on their deeds. Why are they judged on their deeds? They're judged on their deeds to determine their level of judgment in the same way believers at the judgment seat of Christ are judged for our level of reward. Let me try to illustrate it this way. Alcatraz is located in the San Francisco Bay. The San Francisco Bay, the reason you could not escape Alcatraz, it was shark-infested waters. So you couldn't get to San Francisco without risking your life because of shark-infested waters in the San Francisco Bay. Alcatraz is in the San Francisco Bay. If you were assigned when Alcatraz was open, you were assigned to either maximum security, medium security, or minimum security, depending on your crime. So if you had a, you were a real bad murderer, that's maximum security. If you had done a, a, a more of a medium kind of crime, that was medium or minimum. Now, you're in Alcatraz, but your level of judgment would vary based on your crime or the deed you did. Now, you were stuck there. Hell is placed in the lake of fire. It's not that the people are on fire, it's that the place they're located is surrounded by a lake that's on fire. So don't picture hell as a place with fire popping out of people's skin. It is an environment that is surrounded by flames, which means you can't escape. There are sharks in the water of fire that won't let you out. But everybody who goes to hell doesn't go there equally. Some are in maximum security, the bottomless pit, minimum security, and minimal security based on their deeds. So a good sinner is not judged at the same level as a bad sinner. A Hitler is not judged like a nice neighbor, even though both may have rejected Christ. Both are housed in a place they can't escape from, but they're not housed in the same level of judgment. And so 
We now in the millennium at the white throne judgment, and that leads us to eternity. Verse chapter 21 of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth passed away, the uncreation, and there is no, no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, the place where you and I will go when we, when we die or when we are raptured, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, this, uh, I didn't talk about it, but in chapter 19, verses 7 to 10, it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is a 1,000-year party, which takes place in the millennium. But now we have been ushered into eternity, the eternal state where we will forever be with the Lord, where the earth and the whole universe will be filled with his glory. I have left out so much stuff, but I want to conclude. I want to conclude my time with you in all seriousness by asking you to turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. No, this is a lot to take. This is just a survey, but I hope it gives you a timeline, a feel, a direction. This is now, beloved, verse 1, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind and way to remember. Verse 3, know, for, know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? My grandmother said he was coming. My great-grandmother said he was coming. My great-great-great-grandmother was coming. I'm telling my kids he's coming. You know, I'm telling y'all he's coming. And he says, don't be surprised when folks show up and say, we ain't seen him yet. When they mock his coming, for ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. There is no divine intervention. He says, when folk cause you or try to get you to deny, to deny this prophetic calendar, he says, when they maintain this, verse 5, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. He says, now when they tell you that everything's remained the same, they've forgotten something. Everything's not remaining the same because God destroyed the world with the flood during the time of Noah. When he got sick and tired of the way the world was going, he shut this mama down. So if, you, if so, you're tempted to doubt what he's going to do tomorrow, he said, you better go back and check what he did yesterday when he got to the point where he couldn't stand anymore his rejection. Then he says, but by his word, but by his word, verse 7, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape you, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years like one day. So Jesus died two days ago in the calendar of God. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise. As some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away, roar, the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed, in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. What he says is all of this, all of this is predicated on one thing, whether God tells the truth. And if you believe God is telling the truth, 
He says, don't let this escape you. He is waiting on you. He's waiting on sinners to get saved and saints to get busy. He's waiting on sinners to come to Christ and saints to stop playing church. He's waiting on sinners to be forgiven and saints to do evangelism. He says, I'm waiting on you because he says, all this stuff you placing all your time on is going to be burnt up. Your car going to burn. Your house going to burn. Your money going to burn. Your clothes going to burn. It's all going to burn up. So don't act like you're going to permanently have anything. If you go to a junkyard, that stuff used to look good. But over time, it's not worth a thing. So don't let your attachment to earth cause you to lose sight of heaven. Don't let your commitment to history cause you to lose sight of eternity. When a woman is pregnant, she begins to paint her room and get her things together because she's expecting something. You and I are to get ready because we're expecting someone. We're waiting for the rapture. We're waiting for the opportunity to be with the Lord. And it's time now. It's time now to get busy for the Lord and his kingdom. I don't know what your life, my life has been like, but since we're still here, we still have some time to make it right, to get right with God, to get right with each other, and to get busy for the Lord. This is not a time to play Christians. This is not a time to just have it on your bumper sticker. This is the time to let it be known I'm a visible, verbal follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a kingdom disciple. I'm a representative of God. This is a time to get an act of kindness card. Do a good act of kindness and say, by the way, if you died today, do you know where you would spend eternity? And I've got some good news for you. The price has already been paid. I'm reminded of the story of the lady who was caught in a hailstorm and the hail was coming down and she was being hit with hail and it was so big she couldn't run to the house in time. A man saw her being uh, plummeted by the hail and he ran out and he covered her and the hail just kept falling on the man. The lady said, true story, a little time later, whenever I see that man, I see scars on him. But I remember the scars are only on him because he covered me when the hail was coming after me.